yeah, go ahead and introduce yourselves, and I guess we can get rolling. Okay. Well, welcome to those who are attending. Uh, my name is Ellen, and I am one of the uh, naturalists out at Severson Dells Nature Center, and I am one of the full-time staff. And with us here, we have Ben, who is our AmeriCorps uh, member who is joining us today. We have Julie, who is another AmeriCorps member joining us today. And we have Andrea, who is another this one of our full-time staff. Working. Oh, but we have a really awesome photo of you. Uh, so this of, is our- Thank Julie. Well, my screen only allows four pictures to show. So, <laughs> so anyway, so here is our staff, our panel of experts. So we have four Barry with a question. So go ahead and see if you can stump us. Um, okay, so we've got three people sitting here and everybody's got a different question, but- um, Okay. What is your favorite nature app? So if you're going out, oh Andrea, on your app, what do you? What is your go-to? Well, I don't mind starting this one off. I'm sure everyone has an app that they really appreciate. There's a handful I use, but probably my favorite is an app called iNaturalist. Are you familiar with that? Yeah. Okay, thank goodness. So my normal spiel is that it's a fun, free, easy to use way um, to both share valuable information with nature researchers, but also to learn about the nature in your community. And we use that a lot here out at Severson Dells and Forest Preserves of Winnebago County. In fact, anything posted within the Forest Preserves gets automatically added to a project that Julie and I monitor to keep an eye on the biodiversity out there and figure out what's where and when it's there. Um, so it's a really useful tool. So I'm glad you're familiar with it. Huh. All right. Hannah, did you have a question? Caroline, do you have any nature questions? Okay. They're working on their questions. <laughs> All right. Anybody? Um, I was going to, I guess, oh, I was oh, just going to say that is running. Are you guys any educational programs out at Severson Bells right now? We are kind of um, wrapping up our summer season um, and getting ready for our fall season. So we have a lot on our calendar for um, September through December. But right now, coming up right now, we have this. Um, this Saturday, we're working with 815 outside, and because it is Rockford Day, we have a whole bunch of stuff going on on Saturday. And since this one is kind of Julie's baby, I'll let her take the uh, lead on that one. Sure, yeah. So I don't know if you're familiar with the 815 outside initiative. Um, but we're a partnership of nature centers and outdoor related programs and groups in the Winnebago County area, um, promoting people to get outside, enjoy our green spaces, explore and connect with nature. Um, so we, in July, started the 815 Outside Hike and Bike Series. Um, we're doing three or four a month of free guided hikes on uh, different forest reserves and Rockford Park District uh, properties throughout the area. And these hikes have been selling out really fast. They're free, but we register, there's a pre-registration that is limited to 10 people for safety. Um, and all of our events so far have sold out. And so to kind of meet that demand and also um, raise excitement for Rockford Day this Saturday, we're hosting four hikes in one day all at Severson. Hi, hey, Carly. Okay, so do you have any? Okay, 
Well, we got to mute ourselves. Okay, sorry, we have a question in progress. Go ahead. I'd like to take a quick moment to circle back to your app questions. There's a couple other apps we love to use for educational purposes, if you're interested. Um, I have an app that's called Frog Calls, and you can find it on Play Store or Apple Store, but that's awesome because it plays the calls of local frogs. Um, I also have an app called Sky Map, and you might have something like that. I know there's a couple different versions where you can hold your phone up to the sky and see constellations. But my favorite super niche app is one called Rocked. It's spelled like rock with a D at the end. And that'll tell you the type of bedrock you're standing on no matter where you are. And it also links to scholarly articles on the bedrock you're standing on. So if you're a rock nerd, it's a great way to start to learn what kind of rocks are around you. Do you have anything that identifies fossils? That would be amazing. If it exists, I'm upset that I don't know about it yet. Um, yeah, that's my answer to that. I don't know, but I would hope there is. Because we were in Michigan Lakeshore and pulled, you know, found a bunch of stuff, but we're having trouble identifying it. Is there a good place to find a source for Midwest kind of beach fossils? Um, you can always try sending it to me. I have a professor that I'm in close contact with who I send all my fossils to. It's kind of great to have those connections because he's pretty much my iNaturalist for fossils. So I'm happy to share that professor with you in lieu of the lack of an iNaturalist for fossils. Perfect. You got a question here? Okay, you're good. All right, go ahead. Is there anybody on or am I monopolizing all the time? No, I think you're our only person so far. Well, I'm happy to do this then. Okay, I have another question. Are you teaching any classes virtually over this winter? Like that we could like social distance this winter with? Or we... And I'm thinking like virtual field trip type things. We don't have anything planned. Um, right now, all of our programs are in person, but they're limited to the number of people and we uh, are, are asking for masks. So that is um, how we're working on our management of for, for COVID. Um, and we have uh, we also, anything that is an indoor program, we do have the social distancing in place. Oh, there's Andrea. Um, so that uh, we can make sure that everybody is safe distance, but most of our stuff is outdoors. Um, is there, and this is a, a different, maybe a different question. Um, and Andrea, I think, I've talked to you plenty. My name's Erin Berry. I'm working with the Girl Scout troop up at Kieselberg. So, oh, we love the Girl Scout troop. And then that's Julie, too, who's been working with you. Yeah, you guys, this is, it's been a really great project for them. Um, do you guys have any, so when you have an, do you guys have any indoor spaces we can use or um, for meeting spaces? Or is it like if we book a program, is there, you say that we've got plenty of space inside to, to, to utilize then, right? Are you running those Girl Scout badge workshops? That's a good question. Hold that thought. Okay. We're, we're very much struggling with what happens when it becomes November. Yeah, I think a lot of people are running into that issue. I know we've done some space rentals in the past, in COVID, but I don't know what our policy will be moving forward. So maybe Ellen has that answer. Okay. She's probably talking to me across the office. Okay. 
<laughs> well, and even if we're looking, but if you guys are holding bad workshops, that might be sufficient as well. Um, I'm trying to think if we have any other questions. Well, let me answer your question about scout groups. Um, yeah. We, we are, if scouts would like to come out here and do a program, they are welcome to do so. Um, and you can rent our spaces um, okay. as long as we're following state and county guidelines for, you know, COVID prevention and, and social distancing. So it would have to be a limited number, which usually is not a problem with our local scouts. Um, but we would probably limit it to 10 people. Okay. Um, and with that, you know, we, we, we're not doing the scout programs as we have in the past where we said on this day, we'll be teaching X because um, we didn't have a lot of um, response to that. So it's going to be more going back to the old model of you want like to bring your scouts out here, contact us and we'll set up a, a date and a program with you. Are you guys doing the canoeing? We are not doing the canoeing this summer, um, which breaks my heart. We just couldn't find a way to safely do it. We ran canoe camp and that went super well, but those circumstances are a little different than canoe convoys, which was our reasoning for not doing canoe convoys, but doing canoe camp, if that makes sense. Nope, that's okay. If, okay, so, oh yeah, then I'd have two kids in this non-same family in a canoe. Yep, okay. I'm trying to figure out guidelines and procedures too, um, and capabilities. Um, yeah, I would check in with Rocktown and see if they're still doing any rentals. I know Kishwaukee Canoe has been doing rentals over the summer. I can't speak personally about what precautions they're taking for COVID safety. I don't know what measures they're looking into, um, but it might be worth checking. Yeah. We're we're trying to figure out, yeah, what's safe and what's not, and we're trying to figure out um, our policies keep changing too as the uh, environment keeps changing. Yeah, I would also say if you're looking for specific policy recommendations, the American Canoe Association has released guidelines for trips led through them. Um, and generally speaking, no masks on the water, masks on land, and lots of sanitization, but that could be something you could refer to if you're trying to create water sports programs and see what works. Well, that's a really good guideline. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You guys are so quiet. I don't believe this. I bet when we get off the phone, you're going to have 10 questions. No. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do not have any. Oh, um, are you guys willing to maybe trade, um, is your picnic shelter governed, are you guys willing to possibly trade picnic shelter rentals for service projects? Or is that, uh, that's two, two different things. So the, the picnic shelter is rented through the forest preserves, not through us. Uh, so you'd have to take that up with them. Okay. I have no other I, questions. Ideas? You guys are so quiet and you're very chatty normally. I don't buy this. Um, I think that's it for now. Um, Here's a question for you. What 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 are your uh, preferred methods for keeping squirrels out of your bird feeder? A baffle, <laughs> oh. a moat full of piranhas. Uh, no, honestly, I use two baffles. I use the skirt baffle and then the long twenty-four to thirty-inch baffle for the two bird feeders I have. And then I have one squirrel proof. Right. And a key to that would also be location to roof and trees, because although your baffles can prevent them from coming up from the ground, 
it may not prevent them from jumping from above. Oh, my so that would be the next thing. Effort. That's a good question. I'm trying to show you and myself facing camera, our baffle system here. Um, it's worked generally pretty well, and Ellen's correct, we were very careful with the placement of our bird feeders, um, and that's helped us keep those squirrels away. Um, another thing you can try is um, hot pepper powder. Um, so like jalapeno powder or chili pepper powder, you can actually buy special squirrel pepper powder um, and mix it in with the seed. Uh, and it has been shown to, squ squirrels don't like to eat the stuff and so they tend to leave the seed alone and birds are unaffected by it because birds essentially don't have a sense of ta uh, taste. So it's not as big an issue for them and you can actually buy special seed mixes that come with the pepper already blended in. Isn't that also uh, what they use for like rabbits to keep them out of the gardens? Is kind of a little bit of cayenne pepper in the dirt? I haven't read that, but it wouldn't surprise me. I don't know how successful it is. <laughs> it was something I heard years ago, so I don't really know myself, mm -hmm. but. Well, I've also heard uh, at one point, I used to work at a zoo and we were told, uh, put tiger poop around your garden. So I collected it and gave it to my parents. And um, my mother left it in the bag on the corner of her garden and wondered why it was full of flies. It's like, well, you're supposed to distribute it around the garden, don't leave it in the bag. But um, so novel predator um, droppings is something that has been recommended. I don't know how successful that is. Where are the hordes? <laughs> okay, here's one for you. Uh, what grows well with walnut trees? Like, there is there any type of plant or anything that you can think of that would go well with uh, walnut trees? Uh, they are allelopathic. Um, I don't know of anything. Do you, Andrea? Yeah, personally, I wouldn't know of anything. Unfortunately, most of our invasive species are the hardiest and most aggressive. So things like garlic mustard don't appear to have a problem next to walnut trees, but you absolutely should not be planting garlic mustard in your backyard. <laughs> but yeah, it's that fleshy part of the fruit that actually changes the pH of the soil around the trees and makes them um, the surrounding soil almost uninhabitable for a lot of plants. So that's what that lelopathic label means. Right. Okay. According to the Morton Arboretum, slowly pulling this up. Um, let's see. Blueberries, red chokeberry, uh, well, we don't want that as an invasive species. Um, rhododendron, yew, so those are some shrubs. Uh, herbaceous perennials that do well include Baptisia, which is your um, false indigo, correct, Andrea? I believe that's false and indigo. That makes sense about the blueberries. They need a soil pH of 4.5 to 5, which is decently acidic as far as soils go. So that walnut is probably helping them out there. Um, columbine is another native plant that does well. Um, and then the tree category, white birch, although we're not really in white birch territory. Uh, crab apple species, hackberry, larch, linden, um, red pine, white pine, Norway spruce, silver maple, and some of your viburnums. So there's an assortment. Um, and that's on the Morton Arboretum website. And uh, if you Google plants tolerant to black walnut, that should come up. Excellent question.
Ben, do you have any questions? Hmm. Or Julie? <laughs> Well, I had a question that came in um, this morning. This person had caught this large bee at her house and she called here and was concerned that it, well, we're inferring from what she was saying that she thought it was the murder hornets. And so she took some pictures and sent it to us and it was a cicada killer wasp. And those are big wasps, a couple inches long. And, um, very boldly patterned. They've got these pale yellow bands on the abdomen and the abdomen is a dark reddish, orangish, brownish color. And uh, they are terrifying to look at because they're these gigantic wasps, uh, but they are going for cicadas, hence the name cicada killer. So what they do is that they um, sting the cicadas and paralyze them and they grab it with their legs and they fly off with it and the cicada is still alive, it just can't move. And then she takes it down into her nest. She has a nest underground with up to, I think, 16 chambers. And where she has an egg, she will stuff the cicada in there for food for when the egg hatches and the larva is, starts to grow, it will have a live food source. Um, so that was kind of awesome. They are horrific to look at because they are so big. Um, but for the most part, um, they're not, they're not going to be going after people unless you give them a reason to. But uh, they're kind of cool to see. I had one at my house uh, over the weekend, uh, which was pretty awesome. I have another question. Is there any way to get rid of poison ivy besides Roundup? Goats. Okay. I'm not quite <laughs> looking at a goat. <laughs> um. There's also the manual option. There's a couple other pesticide mixes that work. If you are removing it manually, of course, be so careful about everything that touches it. Um, I've seen some people on like very small poison ivy plants use like the dog poop bag method. Um, you just have to be cautious. One common misconception about poison ivy is like how it gets on your skin and like what is on your skin and how to remove it. Um, it's good to keep in mind that it's basically an oil, so the best way to get it off of your skin after initial contact is, of course, a product like Technu or a Poison Ivy Wipe, but also just lots and lots of soap and water and, like, grit to get it off. Um, so that's any tips I have for the manual method. Yesterday I was at Lockwood Park where they have a variety of farm animals and I learned that you can actually rent goats to mow a patch of your yard if you don't want to own your own goat but you want it to be naturally taken care of. I can awesome. I will so do that as soon as I get my first home. <laughs> Another question we had last week, <clears throat> um, somebody had uh, caterpillars on her parsley and she wanted to know how to get rid of them. <laughs> <coughs> and these are uh, black swallowtails. They eat uh, plants that are in the parsley carrot family. And um, so you don't really want to get rid of them um, at this late in the season. This one will probably overwinter as a pupa. Um, this is, but it's eating all my parsley. And I, well, uh, what can I tell you? You know, um, you put the parsley outside, they're going to find it, lay their eggs, and they're going to eat it. Um, um, I rec so she was going to leave the parsley for them. And then she wanted to know, well, how long until they leave? Okay. And it's, I think they're a caterpillar for two or three weeks. And afterwards, they will crawl off and look for some place to pupate. And um, yeah. right. she wasn't right. sure if she would know when they were gone or did they just crawl in the soil in her pot. And that I couldn't tell her. 
Um, so she was we recommended that maybe she put it over where there's Queen Anne's lace, which is a wild member of the carrot family. And um, maybe they would migrate that way once they'd eaten all of her parsley. So we're waiting to hear how that one went. I'd agree with everything you said about their life cycle and that it probably isn't ideal to try to remove them at this point of the season, just because that would really be detrimental to this next generation that's going to really be coming up through a tough time. Here's one for you. How would you uh, recommend the best way to deal with stink bugs? Especially Ooh. that have found their way indoors. Vacuum cleaner. <laughs> I mean, it's a good way to ruin the filter, and I've done that, but... <laughs> well, you can at least be rest assured that most of the stink bugs you're finding in your home are invasive, or at the very least, not native to this region. So if they're in your home, you can feel pretty confident about squashing them. I'm not a big fan of squashing bugs, but those ones, take them out. Well, I wouldn't recommend squashing them because of the stench, but <laughs> getting rid of them, absolutely. One so way of one trapping... Of the things... My cats eat the bugs. <laughs> and we have a cat named Boo. That likes to... Well, your cat does a great job. I have two cats um, called Mittens and Tiger, and they eat <laughs> the stink bugs. Ugh. Well, it says here the best advice for stink bug control is to seal off entry points. Good luck. Um because they're not going to need an awful lot of room to get in. So any little crack or crevice. So it says seal any cracks or holes that are found using a good quality silicone or a silicone latex caulk. Uh, pay close attention to areas around the siding and utility pipes, uh, behind chimneys and underneath the wood fascia or other openings. Uh, replace and repair um, damaged window screens and door screens, turn off the lights. It says stink bugs are attracted to lights. So it's recommended to keep outdoor lighting to a minimum. I like that. Um, so turn off your porch lights, uh, pull down window blinds to prevent light from spilling outside. Um, reduce moisture. So eliminating all moisture buildup around your home can go a long way to prevent any pest infestations. Uh, so look out for leaking pipes. Uh, eliminate food sources, so store all food in airtight containers, keep your garbage covered, etc. cetera. Uh, ventilation, so proper ventilation. Um, check your belongings, inspect items such as boxes containing holiday decorations and grocery bags before bringing them indoors. Stink bugs can travel on these items and make themselves cozy once in the house. Um, then it says keep your branches branches and shrubs well trimmed, store firewood at least 20 feet away and five inches off the ground. Oh, they're not storing a lot of firewood if that's their requirements. Um, and think before squishing. <laughs> um, it does recommend using a vacuum and then dispose of the bag immediately to prevent the odor from penetrating the area because they will leave a residue inside the bag that can stink up your home. So there you go. Those are the 10 top tips. We've had box elder bug infestations here at Severson Dells. My first, my first year here that winter, we, you couldn't swing a dead cat and not hit a uh, box elder bug. They were all over the place, but we haven't had that problem since. So it's been what three or four winters since we've had that. We have like centipede or like those long interns, like they're not like centipedes, centipedes, and they're really like we're trying to take care of them and we read something 
like each year will get long, longer and longer. So like section to section. So that's what we learned from there. And um, so we had lots of them and lots of ants. So yeah. I'll I love agree that you're that, not uh, afraid of them. Oh, sorry. Go for it, Ben. Sure. Um, just to continue Ellen's point real quick that I think uh, I'm also dealing with centipedes and uh, particularly them. And I'm learning that uh, just any amount of prevention really goes a long way uh, for not only having to not deal with them later, but not deal with them now. Um, keeping moisture in your house to an absolute minimum uh, is really helpful. So that means like in bathrooms and places where moisture might accumulate and hang around for a while, you might want to consider putting a dehumidifier in that area just because uh, whether you see it or not, that does become a really ideal place for insects to congregate. And if you're living like in a older space like I am, there are far too many entrances and potential ways into your house to seal off and be able to see them effectively from the inside of your house. So doing things like keeping all sorts of food cleaned up uh, and using a dehumidifier to keep moisture from accumulating really will uh, go a long way in making your house not really desirable for insects to go into. We, we learned that they want the water. That's what I heard about my mom since she's, uh, she looked it up. And so we, we cut them, like, we um, didn't, like, feed, like, water. Water, they want to look for water. But they want to look yes. for water. That's absolutely yep, true. Because all things need water to survive. So remove the water, you will probably remove the problem. Oh, the avalanche of questions. <laughs> well, it is uh, 2.40. We do have a little bit of time, but so if you do have any other questions, uh, feel free to ask. Otherwise, I guess we can uh, work toward calling it a day. Hey, okay, Aaron, last chance. Any question, more questions? No. <laughs> Thank you for asking your questions. We appreciate it. Yeah, a special shout out to this Girl Scout troop because they're helping us do research on local bumblebees and promote education and awareness. We're very, very proud of all the hard work they're putting in. That's terrific. Have they found any awesome bumblebees? Yeah. Do you know what kinds you found? Um, too spotted. A lot of them were too spotted. And I, I think some of them were males. Yeah, we're starting to see a lot more of them right now. Mm -hmm. See them on our flowers in our front yard since we're been growing a lot, so you can see lots of colors in our flowers. They oh, like and I bet those bees are so grateful for your flowers. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you very much for joining us today and giving us a few good questions. You're welcome. 
Well, it looks like they headed out. So thank you guys. And all right. Fun. Well, this thank was obviously you. an idea before it's time. <laughs> well, you know, maybe we can try it again and get a few more people. We'll see. But we'll see. All right. Well, thank, thank you very much. Yep. Thank you. Have a good day, all.